let's turn this recording off. I'll turn this. Hello, everyone, IEDP Pro Seminar students. So good to see everyone. Um, you are probably uh, should be muted uh, on your microphone. If you are not muted, then uh, please do mute yourself so that we can avoid having uh, lots of feedback. Um, we are also going to make ample use of the chat function. So make sure you have your chat function enabled. Um, you can, uh, during Q&A, you can ask questions that way. You can raise your hand and say, please call on me. I have a question. Uh, and we'll, we'll go that way once we go to, to, to Q&A. But without further ado, let's get, uh, let's get rolling. Uh, we're so thrilled to have Dr. Karen Mundy here from the University of Toronto. Um, we had certainly expected to have her on campus and take her to lunch and all of that and have her uh, live with us, but um, we were thrilled when she decided to uh, be able to join us remotely. And uh, given that she's been such a leading thinker in the area of comparative and international education, uh, that she's also been doing some thinking about the impact of uh, COVID-19, uh, which we, we uh, sent the students a blog post on, so that's great. Um, she's also done a ton of thinking on global governance and on institutional institu uh, international institutions and so in many ways is sort of the perfect outside speaker for the International Educational Development Program which has been oriented this way since, uh, since its inception. Uh, Dr. Mundy is, a, as I said, a professor at the University of Toronto. She began her career actually as a school librarian and a teacher in rural Zimbabwe uh, before being pulled back to Ontario to go to graduate school uh, and began her academic teaching career in, at Stanford University uh, and then was recruited back in the early 2000s to become the Canada Research Chair at the Ontario Institute for Studies of Education, which in the parlance of our world is called OISE, um, and uh, she's um, held many posts, published lots of great stuff. I'm not going to take too much time and do too much of it, but I think a couple of things for me really stand out. First of all, she has been, she's a past president of the Comparative and International Education Society, as you probably know from having read her speech. So. Um, she put on a great CIES, actually. I think one of the best CIES conferences ever she led. Uh, that was uh, really well done. Um, and uh, she has had a remarkable talent over the years for being both critical of international institutions like the World Bank and other places, and yet also uh, someone who is always invited to work with them and uh, do research with them, which is not that easy to do. Uh, it's, it's, um, it's, she's really found a good, uh, a good middle ground where she can both be very critical and accepted for her critical views, but at the same time, understand the institutions well enough so that um, they're uh, willing and interested to pull up their shirt sleeves and work with her. The prime example of this was when she went to spend a couple of years in the belly of the beast as the chief technical officer for the Global Partnership in Education. Uh, and she has since returned to uh, academic life. And I think that's, uh, that's probably the, the, the major highlights for, for me. We're gonna turn it over to her. Uh, Dr. Mundy, you can share your screen. And we have a talk. She's gonna talk for about 40 minutes, let's say. Um, and then we are going to uh, go to Q&A. I have four or five of you from the uh, discussion blog that I will use the chat function to ask you to ask your question. Uh, but I want you to do it on video, unmute yourself and do it on video. And then we'll go to Q&A and uh, then we'll be, we'll be done. Without further ado, Dr. Mundy. getting myself unmuted. And thanks so much, Alex, for the introduction. It was a very kind introduction. And um, I might just say before I launch into my slides that 
you might attribute my ability to work in international organizations to two things. One is I'm a Canadian and Canadians are really nice <laughs> and not very threatening. And, but the other is that all through my career, I've just been able to work with some of the most amazing graduate students. And so in almost every international organization, I can call uh, former uh, collaborators and students, my friend, and that has allowed me to gain access to some of the inner workings of international organizations over my career. Uh, and, and I think uh, they have been remarkably interested in others from the outside doing research. So I really encourage you all as you go on to your careers to uh, build and forge those relationships with uh, academics that um, may help you in your own work uh, or if you become academics to forge relationships with those working in international organizations. I think you'll find that you have plenty in common even if you're quite critical of their policies and practices. So I'm titling this talk Global Governance and Educational Change and that will become it'll become a little more apparent why I use this term global governance in a few slides. But I wonder if anybody knows what this uh, picture is of. Has anybody seen this before? It's a Miro, it's a, it's a Joan Miro painting. And it's a painting that uh, was uh, created by Miro at, uh, at UNESCO, at its central offices in Paris. Um, from the very beginning of my career, both as an educator and as a scholar, I was fascinated with this challenge of international coordination and the opportunity that international coordination might give us, the purchase it might give us uh, to improve redistributive justice around the world. And the founding, of course, of, of contemporary international organizations really came at this moment when at the end of the Second World War, uh, UNESCO was formed and I think uh, the fact that Miro uh, gave his some of two actually very large murals were painted uh, on the on site at UNESCO so is very suggestive of the the level of ambition and in in a way the high modernity that started off uh, this effort to coordinate in the field of education. So let's see how we're. So I'm going to do four things. I want to talk about contemporary challenges to the liberal world order, which really was the founding world order for contemporary international institutions. Uh, what has changed to flows of aid and their organization. I want to talk a little bit about innovation or fragmentation in the aid regime. And you've read Nick Burnett's very harsh uh, critique of uh, current, uh, the current aid regime. And then I'm going to focus a little bit on some current research that I'm involved in, just to give you a flavor of that and some avenues for future research. All right. So just going back to that term global governance, you know, when I started uh, my doctoral uh, research in the 1990s, mid 1990s, it was really the, the blossoming of use of this term. And it had sort of infected both international organizations and fields like political science, where this notion that it was no longer a society of nation states, but rather we should be looking at a society that had several layers of engagement, citizens, civil society, private sector, markets, and states, and that all of these came together to inter and interacted in some way uh, to create a very thick global society. Um, at the same time, that was a period in which there was perhaps more than we might see today, a lot of optimism about the things that global coordination might do in the context of changing uh, and creating a normative purpose uh, at, on the international stage. And I think largely now when we look at global governance, we probably would have to conclude that uh, those, that optimism, those aspirations have largely not been met. And as I'm going to talk about today, may actually be in some form of decline. And we'll talk a little bit about some of the COVID related examples we can turn to uh, that, that show us or signal how poor, how poorly coordinated we are. 
so usage of that term global governance really is intended when I use it to raise awareness of the importance of power operating beyond the state, economic, technological, and non-state actors. Uh, it's used, I use it to signal that debates about global governance should and must bring a renewed attention to a normative inflection when we study international relations and world order. And I'm of those who uh, or it was trained in critical theory, so I do not think that there is an objective truth out there. I think there are truths that contend with one another and that almost every effort, even the most scientific and empirical, is inflected by an, an original normative bias. Uh, and then also, um, I use that term to suggest in my work that actually there's a lot of continuity between the present period and the pre-1945 period, and I'll, I'll say a little bit about that later. So here's an image, sorry it's kind of a crummy uh, resolution, but I think it just speaks uh, so uh, much to what's happening in the liberal world order. Now, I don't know if you'll know what I mean when I say liberal world order, but by that I mean the organization of states that emerged after the Second World War. It evolved primarily as a bipolar world order with the Soviet bloc and a Western bloc. The Western bloc led primarily by the United States and the US acting as, in a sense, the uh, financer and uh, military uh, actor of last resort to prop up that, uh, that, that world order. And then with the U.S. becoming, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, really a multi, uh, moving from a bipolar to a unipolar world order, and now today to a world order in which the U.S. no longer, want, no longer agrees to play the role of the donor, the military actor of last resort. And here you can see, of course, uh, the, the current U.S. president basically asking, is, is that world order any longer worth shouldering? This is a really big change. I don't think you can overemphasize how, how great a change to the structure of international society, the shift in US's, the U.S. and its role uh, is. But of course, it's not only uh, the U.S. that has shaped that. Before I talk a little bit about the other actors that um, have shaped that this change in world order, I want to just talk a bit about embedded liberalism and what that means. So, as you know, liberal theories in political science refer to a whole body of work and and uh, that studies the evolution of dem uh, capitalism and democracy joined together in a single uh, political formation. And after World War II, we can talk about embedded liberalism as an effort among states to differing degrees to try to embed the market in a demo democratic and compensatory uh, regime, i.e. to provide social safety nets and social welfare, to provide opportunities for equalization uh, alongside uh, uh, a free market. And there's always been some tension between the uh, liberal uh, normative values of democracy, of equality uh, and human rights, and of freedom, especially of freedom for the market. That's been a pretty constant feature of world order. This uh, photo, again, not in a great resolution, is uh, a photo uh, at the formation of um, uh, UNESCO. And I just want to highlight how important and significant education was to the creation of that initial post-World War II world order. When UNESCO was formed in its uh, mandate, in its the preamble to its constitution, uh, says that it is its purpose is to achieve full and equal opportunities for education for all. So very, very focused uh, efforts to ensure that as part of this new world order, we would have international institutions like UNESCO and that they would play a compensatory or redistributive role in some way, uh, guiding governments to uh, enhance 
opportunities for everyone in the field of education. And of course, shortly after the formation of UNESCO, we see the creation of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, very much led by advocacy from American non-state actors. And that uh, Declaration of Human Rights also uh, embeds this concept of free primary, at least free first level of education for everyone. Um, so a little bit about this erosion of embedded liberalism. Um, first of all, after the end of the Cold War, there was a pretty strong movement, even before the end of the Cold War, towards a change in thinking about the welfare state, about compensatory liberalism. So a lot of effort to try to rebalance the relationship between state and market and also between state and civil society so that uh, triumvirate of civil society the state and the market starting to shift uh, in emphasis in many many uh, western uh, democracies we sometimes call this the neoliberal consensus although i'm not overly fond of the term because i feel it's used in many plastic ways. So it's not a very um, empirically um, uh, useful uh, construct, but it is a very ideologically useful construct. Um, so this rise of strategies that emphasize markets over markets and civil society over states, uh, partly uh, led by an economic crisis in the late 70s in the Western world, and then following that a debt crisis in the developing world, um, then kind of consolidated in international development in the creation of what's sometimes called the Washington Consensus. So a consensus about how you can slim down the state, how you can ensure that money used by the state is more effective. And in a strange way, it actually led to an, a highlighting of the role of education why? Because if the state would invest in something, it had to invest in something that had a productive or an immediate relationship to the market, and the notion of human capital became very prominent at this time. So yes, more, on edu more emphasis on government spending on these sort of core areas of human development, but in a broader context that thought of the delivery of services in both areas as needing to better emulate some of the expertise and practices of markets and of engaging civil society. Um, and then, of course, globalization. By that, I mean economic globalization. So we start to see an enormous integration and, and set of movements across world economies, um, including in international donor organizations, the rise of different kinds of donors from non-OECD countries. Indeed, we could say the rise of illiberal donors. So many donors uh, from countries that don't actually, in their own uh, political uh, economy, uh, value democracy or um, follow some of the tenets of embedded um, liberalism. Well, Global governance today, as many scholars say, looks a lot like net, a networked uh, system than a hierarchy uh, uh, in which uh, states, are, states are the central actors. And there's many different ways of empirically um, exploring this level of network, but at, including using network analysis. I'm not going to talk about that here, but it does give you a sense of both complexity and thickness uh, in, that, uh, in that global governance um, arena. You might think because of thickness, you will get greater coordination. And in fact, you know, when I was first out of my PhD, I think we had a lot of hope that um, particularly that there would be some great gain from the collapse of the Soviet Union, that civil society itself in this more networked environment would start to play a stronger role in modifying some of the initial move towards uh, market inflected social policies and so on. Um, I think that turned out to be uh, perhaps a bit over optimistic. 
uh, although I still remain, I still think that there are um, some low hanging fruit for civil society to gain because of globalization. But when we look around and when we think about what did we get, what's, what kind of dividend happened after the end of, or the fall of the Soviet Union, I think we can honestly look at global coordination. Um, let me just back up. At the time, at the time when I graduated, all everybody could talk about was Francis Fukuyama's paper called "The End of History," and um, the notion there was that well, now there was no, there's nothing. We just had the sort of Western model. We just had liberalism to to go forward with, and so history really was at an end. There was no friction. But in fact, that's not the way um, things turned out. And, and you can see today a host of failures in global coordination that were not anticipated in 2000. So whether we look at trade and economic regulation in 2000, 20 years ago, I think most critical scholars thought that organizations like the World Trade Organization were going to dominate the world with free trade. In fact, the World Trade Organization became a very, very modest player uh, internationally. Uh, around peace, uh, climate, migration. These are sort of more, trend, more trending currently, information privacy, and now around COVID-19, you really see that there is a failure uh, of coordination, a failure of investment in these international organizations. And it's not just among uh, the traditional organizations. It's not just that Donald Trump stood up on Wednesday at his press briefing and said that he didn't like the WHO and he was going to defund it. It's also that the chief scientist for the European Union uh, resigned on uh, Wednesday because he pointed to the absolute inability of European countries to uh, come together around a common health strategy to defeat COVID. So, this multipolar world system, what does it look like? And I think this uh, pretty bad graphic, but anyway, just is really intended to show you um, just how different the distribution of uh, GDP is today as compared to uh, 20 years ago or even 50 years ago, or sorry, even 70 years ago. And it's funny because when you look at it over the long durée, if you look back to 1700, in fact, um, you see a lot, a lot more uh, sort of almost a return, in fact, to Asia as a very significant player. But today, certainly, the, the collapse of the apex of Western dominance in the world economy is very evident. Um, and then also just wanted to mention this piece, which I think is so critical for those of us working in international development, which is that the way in which poverty and inequality look at a global scale is very, very different. And you can see here that, um, you know, in, in 1988, you just had this huge hump uh, with the developed countries on one side being, uh, being, uh, relatively well off and poverty sitting primarily in, in Asia, South Asia, and, and a bit in Africa. And then today, today of course, you see that, that people call it now, um, people would say that the hump is, the hump is uh, moved and you can see that while there's still a great deal of um, poverty, many of the countries that sat below, whose population sat below the poverty line have now surpassed that poverty line. Uh, and of course, some countries have um, not gained, particularly in Sub-Saharan Africa primarily, and then others, um, developed countries, are no longer exceptional in, in terms of economic prosperity. Um, it's had a big effect. Uh, there's been a big effect on the flows of concessional aid, and uh, you can see that when you look at um, the Development Assistance Committee of the OECD, which reports as best it can, because not all governments, uh, not all non-OECD governments report, but you can see how uh, flows of international development aid have changed over time. And also then look at some of the new donors uh, from uh, the Middle East, um, uh, e even from uh, formerly developed countries, developing countries. And just to point out that, you know, we don't actually have very good 
transparency on uh, the total amount of uh, concessional uh, lending or concessional finance being provided by China, although yesterday I did see that um, the Center for Global Development has a new paper on this. But there are some estimates run by U.S. think tanks that show that the total financing provided by China, that's concessional and non-concessional, includes military aid, is almost as big as that of the U.S. And so perhaps uh, perhaps, uh, not perhaps, I think we are really entering into more of a bipolar world order, again, this time um, with uh, the U.S. and China, uh, but not with the same coordination among Western countries. Well, just to say in summary that uh, we've moved from a sort of state-led uh, uh, world society of embedded liberalism to something that looks more like network global governance. The uh, world system looks more like a multipolar system, both economically and in terms of state power, that patterns of poverty and inequality are changing, that there is a massive failure in global coordination, much as people imagined at the end of the Cold War that there would be a rise that coordination would become a lot easier. In fact, it seems, especially over the last 10 years, to have become much harder. And then um, just to say that, as you might um, expect, uh, there's a lot more differentiation within countries uh, in terms of education. And so you can see, just as you see that poverty within countries, um, poverty between countries may have flattened uh, in comparison, poverty within countries uh, or, or differentiation in educational poverty and other forms of po poverty have often accelerated. Um, well, the world's response to all of these changes for international development is um, the Sustainable Development Goals. And I want to just turn now to talk a little bit about um, quality education for all and whether or not the international aid architecture is really fit for 2030 and looking uh, farther forward for 2050. I'm sitting uh, as a member of uh, UNESCO's um, Future of Education Commission. We're, we're tasked to look to 2050, not to 2030. And um, I think one of the things that uh, was very surprising when we did our sort of future foresight work was that it was very hard for any of us to really think about 2050 without seeing 2030 as a as a turning point. And that's primarily, of course, because of um, climate change. So uh, out of school children, I mean, there's different ways of talking about educational inequality or education poverty or uh, bottom of the pyramid, which is uh, Dan's uh, wonderful way of uh, framing uh, that problem. And, and we can pull out different um, vectors. I mean, for example, it is absolutely the case that many more children in Africa, where I've done most of my work, now realize access to education than uh, I would have thought possible uh, when I was a teacher in um, the late 80s in Zimbabwe. At the same time, some things have proved very stubborn and very difficult to achieve. And one of those things is uh, reaching out of school um, uh, children. So you can see that since about 2010, there's been a kind of stagnation in the total number of out-of-school children. Why is this? It's partly because in many of the poorest parts of the world, population growth rates have continued continue to accelerate, and that's particularly the case uh, in, in Africa. So that's propping up that, that number. But still, um, you would have anticipated a much greater advance in, in reducing this number of out-of-school children. The other thing that's turned out to be quite a stubborn challenge, not very effectively dealt with, is the number of children or proportion of children and adolescents not achieving minimum learning by country income group. And here you can just see that in some parts of the world, and particularly in low-income countries, a very high proportion of children are not um, meeting the very basics, um, basic, not achieving very basic uh, learning outcomes. This, by the way, is uh, borrowed from UIS, and um, they, they have just actually published new data that updates these figures. So again, um, 
this, this actually is a projection. This is from our world in data. If you haven't taken a look at that website, it's just wonderful because you can plot almost anything into their model and, and to see how, uh, what the world would look like by 2050. And this is um, the number of people aged 15 with no education on current trends. If things continued as they are, what would happen? And here you can see why attention to Africa, I think is so important at this point, because of, you can see that the curve is going down for, um, Asia and South Asia, but for Africa, the curve stays very, very flat. Um, well, what are international donors doing about it? So first of all, just to highlight, there's been some great recent research, including by uh, Francine Menashe, one of my former students, on um, bilateral aid. And this particular piece that I refer to here is uh, a, net a network analysis. And one of the things that it shows is that bilateral aid donors actually are still primarily driven um, by geopolitical concerns. If you look at it in a networked way, you'll see that they do not seem to uh, link their aid to need, but actually to geopolitical uh, advantages. Um, a smaller priority of aid is given to education than many other sectors. This is a quite an interesting phenomena. So global health financing has increased enormously. But global education um, financing has not. There's a number of reasons that people have posited for this, including the fact that global health tends to be seen as something more, um, more of a, a global risk of something health, health, health uh, problems have no borders, as we're seeing now with COVID, where, whereas education is really considered the sovereign territory of national governments. That's one way of putting it. Another hypothesis is that the global health folks can actually um, inoculate. They can, they can take measures that show very um, instant or very immediate results. And in education, in fact, most of the reforms or um, offerings that we have uh, are very difficult and, and you know, the, the treatment, the dosage is is long is long li lived and the outcomes uh, take a long time to realize. I must say though, if anybody ever wants to pick a thesis, I think this comparison of health and education is very underdeveloped and, and needs a lot more um, a lot more work. The the share of basic education to Africa is in decline. This is counterintuitive given what I just showed you about the numbers of out-of-school children, for example, or the numbers of children not learning. And I think this, you can say, largely is driven in part by a repoliticization of international development assistance. Um, so just a little more about the <laughs> changing shape of, of the global aid architecture. Um, well, I've already, in a way, highlighted or given you a preview of this, that it's a, it's a very imperfect architecture. And you could see that from Nick Burnett's piece, that there are very low levels of funding for education, that financing tends to be skewed towards middle-income countries and towards higher level of education. So for example, countries in G7 countries themselves tend very much to focus on um, scholarships and tertiary level. And that's partly uh, due to um, an expectation that those are the areas where governments can best plant a flag, especially bilateral donors. There's been over time very limited support to basic education, although it did grow in the 2000s, uh, it kind of leveled off. And so today um, it remains at a much higher level than it was in the two, early 2000s, but still not, not anywhere near in volume uh, to upper that provided to upper levels. There's a great lack of coordination. And actually in education, a lot of interagency competition. So you could say that like GPE and the World Bank and UNICEF are all chasing the same uh, uh, sovereign dollars from, uh, from their donor countries. Um, and by and large, there's a pretty limited use of multilateral channels. You can see this in any studies that look at the dispersion of aid. And you see that in a given country, 
for I'll give examples from Africa. In, in some countries or in many countries in Africa, you'll find more than 12 to 15 principal donors all offering smaller amounts um, and not uh, and, and that the multilateral channels themselves do not dominate uh, uh, the uh, aid delivery. One of the things that happened over time is that there's been a very high use of projectized aid. And despite that in the early 2000s, there was an effort under the Paris Declaration to highlight the need for um, pooled funding for, for uh, aid that's delivered on budget. In fact, I think since then, there's been, a, especially since 2010, there's been a real, really remarkable pullback towards um, donors managing aid, running it as parallel to uh, national budgets, uh, using non-state actors as subcontractors to deliver uh, parts of the projects. And, and basically, um, uh, because of a new emphasis on results-based financing uh, and fears that governments won't, won't deliver, pulling uh, funding back into more project projectized um, approaches. And then finally, just to say that UNESCO has largely been eclipsed within this international uh, architecture. And, and Nick Burnett uh, gives a very harsh assessment of why that might be so. I might say that my own assessment is that, um, you know, you kind of have a chicken and egg story here that is international donors uh, did not did did not choose to pool funding, uh, and UNESCO declined, and then UNESCO once declined, never could regain uh, its status. Um, big rise in new actors. This is a really interesting area of research, and you're starting to see some excellent pieces on um, partnership-based models. So Francie Manashi has a new book on out on uh, this notion of partnership. Now, partnership's a funny notion because really what it is is an effort to elevate non-state actors and actors from uh, the for-profit sectors to an equal status with nation states in multilateral fora. You can see this um, happening in all the UN agencies, which now have sort of partnership-based mechanisms the Global Compact, for example, in the UN, which brings, which is a sort of round table of uh, private sector actors. UNICEF has a partnership-based model. GPE's governance is not one nation, one vote as UNESCO's is, but it is one nation, or it is regional constituencies, and then constituencies of civil society, the private sector and foundations. Um, then this new focus on refugees and migration, uh, you can see this in two ways. First of all, this new entity, Education Cannot Wait. Um, one might have imagined that UNICEF or GPE could have been great vehicles for a greater focus on system level uh, attention to refugees, ensuring that governments include in their education system reform agenda in, um, uh, opportunities for refugees and migrants and migrants to be part of the educational system, but instead there was the creation of this new um, new entity. Uh, at the same time, the World Bank has become an, a major funder of education in emergency settings. That is something that you will not find much written about, but it is remarkable. In fact, one might even say revolutionary when you look at uh, the bank's traditional portfolio. And then a lot of new mechanisms, new ideas about how you can leverage a funding. So the International Facility for Financing Education Development, IFID, uh, came out of the Education Commission's work and it will be launched next year. It focuses on providing, um, improving the terms on which multilateral banks, the World Bank primarily, but also Africa Development Bank and so on, can offer loans to middle-income countries. And then the Education Outcomes Fund, which is actually a very curious mechanism. It's going to deserve a lot of study. <coughs> Today I was talking to uh, folks in the ministry in Ghana. Ghana will be one of the first countries to receive um, funding out of the Outcomes Fund. And that fund intends to uh, do payment by results through fairly complicated financing arrangements that, uh, that uh, allow third parties to pay uh, 
uh, non-governmental organizations for delivery of educational results. And then, of course, as I've already mentioned, the rise of non-Western donors, especially um, the remarkable rise of donors from the Middle East and then now China through the Belt and Road um, Initiative. Initially, you know, China was very hesitant to get involved in education, um, in part because um, China, China always has seen education as very much part of its own national culture. It wouldn't want others to dictate or prescribe education reform to it, but that's actually changed quite a bit uh, over time. And now um, Belt and Road Initiative uses education very much as a sort of soft power as part of a uh, Chinese um, bid to uh, create um, a, a more uh, Chinese oriented world order. Um, this explosion of private authority, I've written a couple of books on it and, and lots of short papers. You see it almost everywhere. So again, that um, pull towards thinking not so much of what governments can do, but, but what can civil society and markets do. Lots and lots of growth in this area in international development. So lots of um, funding for private provision or franchises. Uh, the Chan Zuckerberg Foundation, Pearson, Omidyar, for example, uh, these global education franchises, not doing that well reputationally, I must say, because of a very large uh, civil society um, uh, advocacy campaign against them, uh, the Global Campaign for Education, the new Abidjan principles, but also um, a really, really advanced market of um, commercial providers of goods and services that undergird education systems. And, the, you know, they may not be, um, some of them are, are sort of first generation, like uh, the monopoly that book, uh, textbook publishing companies have had for many years, uh, throttling really the availability of learning materials because of very high costs uh, and kickbacks to corrupt governments in Africa, for example, to the newer order of goods and services such as um, education technology, which now is used, you know, similar platforms that are used in Ontario, where I'm living, and, and in many um, African or other developing countries. Uh, civil society, again, it's still there, and it's, uh, it's very vocal, but uh, one, might, one might say that uh, in today's uh, world order, you, f you see both liberal and illiberal forms of civil society and in a sense uh, the aggregation of civil society in terms of pushing uh, global governance hasn't been as effective as I said as we perhaps thought in in 2000 it would be. Um, I think this is especially apparent around climate change that you've got a lot of civil society effort but actually it's not aggregating the, the foothold to gain a voice is not um, there. Well, I always like to um, tell my um, students that I still think there are two main horses in the education reform race and that, um, that if we think about them, we can see how these are inflecting in the work of international organizations. On the one hand, we have this effort that, I mean, and these are all still very Western oriented, yeah? One is building a culture that is inclusive of the key frontline actors. So this is, I call it inclusive culture of equity and excellence. You'll see a lot of effort to promote this by folks like Passy Selberg, like Michael Fullen. Um, high performing education systems in the Western world tend to think of this reform model when they design their education um, their, their sector and plan for their sector. It really emphasizes creating this culture of high aspirations. So yes, uh, first starting point is that we can't improve learning outcomes unless we tackle the problem of low learning outcomes in the tail of the distribution. So you can't just pull the top and expect everybody to advance. You have to lift the tail. Um, a lot of emphasis on money mattering. Uh, and so, uh, pretty large societal commitments to funding education, commitments to working with frontline providers, i.e. teachers, to build their professional capacity and a lot of reliance on their professional judgment, um, focus on learning for all, 
this notion that if you're going to have yes you're still going to have accountability you're still trying to decentralize decision making but you want to have professionals um, playing a collaborative role in constructing these standards and norms um, you might be using testing data but you're using that testing data uh, with a very strong emphasis on um, improving the capability of those frontline workers to improve uh, their uh, teaching practice and to improve their professional judgment. And then on the other side, you have this sort of um, horse in the race that really still focuses on incentives and rewards that is um, uh, punitive in the use of incentives. Uh, so uh, here, this idea we, we associate with neoliberal policies in education to use market-like or market-based mechanisms and models to increase comp competition um, and to ensure that there's innovation in the system. Uh, less emphasis on money. So here, the notion is that money isn't that important. In fact, more money can actually be wasted. So really, cost effectiveness is the emphasis in this model. And then um, emphasis on standards and measurable outcomes and accountability, so um, hard accountabilities for improvement in learning outcomes, and then um, test-based accountability, incentives incentives that come with material uh, rewards. They These two could, um, they share some things like decentralization and accountability, and in that sense, both might, um, you know, those who are really critical of neoliberalism will see will think of them as being in the same camp. I personally think that they are actually quite different models. One hearkening back to uh, stronger um, uh, embedded liberal uh, account of how societies can provide equitable education, and the other uh, really thinking differently about the role of nation states and uh, subnational actors in education. <laughs> I want to point to this one piece that I think is so remarkable in the field of comparative education and that interests me a great deal, which is the, in a way, the return to high modernism in the use of evidence in education. What do I mean by that? There's a sense that science can help us and solve our problems and that um, evidence itself uh, evidence alone will drive educational change. You can see this a lot in international organizations who are in fact the great suppliers of what Nick Burnett um, calls global goods. I actually, this is the one part that I disagree very strongly with Nick Burnett on because he calls for a massive global investment in global public goods, in more evidence, in more evidence capability. And I think actually part of the pathology of international organizations and their work is that for many years, they have reshaped themselves to become the suppliers of these global goods, to become the holders of this uh, evidence and science, rather than uh, effectively stimulating um, the use of that evidence, putting that evidence in the hands of frontline educators, of middle managers in ways that allow them to solve problems, to act iteratively and adaptively within their own systems. So I, I call this the high modernism and I think today you can see it particularly in the rise, rising use of um, tools from the field of economics in studying education policy. And that isn't to say that economics doesn't have much to offer in terms of helping governments and other actors to understand what works and what doesn't, doesn't work. But at some point, high modernism is used to, imp to imply that evidence overtakes our sense of needing to have democratic forms of judgment guide education policy. And I think that is a, a great risk and is unlikely to um, stand us well when we think about effective education reform. Now, for those of you who have ever read Critical Theory or Jürgen Habermas, you will know that I am essentially doing a riff on Habermas here when he spoke to the 
um, use of uh, knowledge and in, in public policy in uh, welfare states. So what am I working on now? I'm, uh, I've got two uh, large-ish research projects underway. One is, um, and these are very practical in focus. So I've decided because, and you folks are much younger than I, but I've, I'm at a point in my career where I can see the end of it. I can see that the number of years before I will retire are not so great. And I had to do a lot of thinking to decide how I would spend these years. Perhaps I have two cycles of research to go before I will, um, two, maybe three before I would retire. So for this first, for this period, these next five years, I want to really focus again on education in Africa. It's where I started and it's uh, where where I want to do uh, the remaining uh, field work in my career. And I've started by getting really very interested in the reform, the inter intersect between international organizations and their reform agendas, and the way in which um, African governments themselves respond to uh, the various uh, uh, opportunities for funding and technical assistance from those international organizations. The first project is looking at um, trying to understand how implementation and delivery are shaped by the uh, in, by the inputs from international donors in uh, efforts to reform African education systems. We'll be looking specifically at delivery units, Michael Barber's notion of deliverology. This is a policy approach. It's not really a set of policies, but it's a set of, of routines and approaches to that, that claim to be able to improve the improve in the delivery of public services and overcome some implementation barriers. We started with uh, countries where uh, delivery units have actually been financed by uh, DFID. Uh, in fact, DFID is funding this research, which makes it all, all the more interesting. But we're also interested in other kinds of managerial approaches that are being used. Um, in particular, if you go back to the two horses in the race, we're very interested to know whether there are differences between reform approaches that focus on enabling and activating um, leadership in lower levels, more distributive leadership in lower levels of the system, as versus those that are focused more on incentives and accountability that is more hierarchically organized. Um, then the second piece of research is a piece of work funded by the Gates Foundation to really look at how system diagnostics and other approaches to use of evidence in education policy in African countries has evolved, how effectively has it evolved to focus on uh, the learning crisis, and then um, what kind of political economy uh, do we see within developing countries as they adopt these approaches. So for example, do they really just adopt these in a more formalistic way because donors attach other forms of financing to their use? Uh, what kinds of uh, demand or do they have within, do African uh, governments have within their systems for such tools? How do the tools get utilized over time and um, whether, whether or not uh, there's sustainability built into these uh, approaches that lead governments to evolve uh, towards use of evidence uh, that are that is um, driven by their own capacities or capacities of national stakeholders. Well, just finally, um, you know, I I saw Alex, Alex sent me um, some of your questions. They were great questions, but. And, and, but I had done this slide before I saw your questions, but they very much align with them. Um, the first question that I have and that I've been puzzling over a lot is, you know, what, what should education's global governance look like post-COVID and then by 2050? I'm really happy to answer questions on that particular topic. Although I have to say that my thinking, like I said, it's almost as if you kind of you get to 2030, you can say exactly what should happen. And then when you look at that longer frame, um, you, it's, it becomes very difficult. Uh, I think it's, it's very instructive to try to think to 2050 rather than 2030, uh, but very hard. And then um, how can we really support this more open country-driven driven knowledge architecture? 
um, you know, that term evidence-based decision-making uh, needs to take on a different inflection than I think the way the current global architecture uh, supports, which is really towards supply, um, the, the, the donors supply the evidence and countries are more like the hewers of wood and the drawers of water in this evidence-based um, policy uh, and decision-making. So I'm going to stop there and just thank you very much for your uh, interest in having me, Alec and, and Dan, and really looking forward to the questions. And I will stop sharing my screen. Here we go. <laughs> Back to you. <laughs> There's always a baby or a cat I'm finding on these Zoom calls. I just love it. <laughs>
um, participating, but states primarily representing that triumvirate at the national uh, level. And a lot of IOs tried to do this, but they became very state-centric, partly, of course, because it was the Cold War, right? That's what happened to UNESCO in a sense. It became highly um, politicized. And then since, and then, and then you have other organizations, the World Bank, if you think about it from that perspective, you think that it built trust based on a totally different cur currency. The two currencies the bank had was, it is a financial institution, very well managed financial institution, and it is an institution that is led by the science of economics. So it has a kind of interface between the political, um, uh, civil society. It has a buffer. It doesn't really respond very much. Um, it's not, it's, it's somewhat politicized, but not terribly politicized in the way that UNESCO um, became. Well, let me put it, let me say this. For an international organization to effectively engage that triumvirate of state, civil society, and the market, it will become, it is very messy. So each organization is trying to find a kind of win-win solution um, to do this. But I don't think those organizations can effectively uh, work at a global level without this sort of trust and solidarity. And so they have to, in some way, engage, have a way of engaging uh, governments, civil society, and markets. I don't think we've come up with the right recipe for that in any of the international organizations. I thought, I think GPE on that, um, on that file in particular is, is really a disaster actually, because it has a kind of lowest common denominator governance structure. It's meant to be very open and, but it is actually not. In, in the end, um, donors dominate because the other actors tend to have a, um, uh, to tend to be fragmented, except when when they're not, and in that case, they tend to focus on things that are politically important to them. In other words, they use they they tend to use the international organization as a the venue shop. So, like in GPE, the civil society actors are super effective at getting GP to stop uh, funding private provision of education. They they've been they held the board ransom to that. And that I think was great, but <laughs> they've been super ineffective in uh, driving, um, in, in harnessing demand from countries for more investments in uh, basic education, in education for the poor, in helping governments to re, to to adjust their political economy uh, towards more of this embedded liberal kind of notion. So. I don't think that's really an answer, but, but, um, and then the other thing is I have, I have got more appreciation after working at GPE for UNESCO because I saw how hard it is to govern with this sort of um, openness to a wider uh, decision making process that engages a wider set of actors. I think actually UN organizations and those these UN summits and so on can be um, can, are more are more important than might meet the eye, even though they're terribly, terribly, terribly frustrated, frustrating to to work with. And I don't think we're going to get better global governance without them. Uh, but again, like I said, I don't think we've found the right recipe. And you can kind of see that in the SDGs. You know, the MDGs, if you ask most African heads of state, they'll, they'll tell you that the MDGs were a disaster. They had no ownership, they had no investment in it. And if you ask them what's good about the SDGs, they, would, they will say, well, now we can spend money on tertiary and uh, upper level secondary education, on science, on the true motors of development. Well, I mean, that doesn't seem to me to be the best form of advance from the MDGs. So in the S MDGs focused on, uh, had an embedded liberal kind of focus, focusing on those at the bottom of the pyramid. The SDGs have a very wide focus, but with a lot more emphasis on those at the middle and top of the pyramid. It's better owned by countries, but somehow the voice of those that are disenfranchised are not captured as effectively this round. So yeah. I don't know what the answer is, but my sense is that those processes are, are 
pivotal and thinking how to do them a bit better is very important. Well, it must be seem be feel freeing to be able to say some of these things about GPE. <laughs> but at the same time, don't you think GPE is, you know, done a good job of being committed to country dialogue and that it's more than just uh, lip service compared to some other organizations? I, I guess what I could say and still be discreet is that I think that um, people in leadership roles like the one I had there for four years uh, spend fight an uphill battle to make that so but in practice all of that effort can't overcome the fact that GPE is fundamentally dominated by the donor organizations its lead donors um, and that uh, what it can deliver what it can do to support countries is shaped by the agencies that actually deliver its funding, that implement the funding. And that basically is about 65 to 75% the World Bank, it changes year on year. So basically GP is no better and no worse uh, than uh, what the bank is able to deliver on, on the files related to poverty and, and um, equality. Interesting. I, I also wanted to mention that uh, the term evidence-based uh, policy, which of course has uh, taken on a meaning of its own, we should be a little careful when we critique it too much because otherwise you end up with what we've got here in the U.S., which is yeah. evidence-free policymaking. Well. <laughs> <laughs> well, the U.S. is a conundrum, isn't it? I mean, exceptional in so many ways, but there's no greater... I always, I always used to say when I first started my uh, doctoral work and I was looking at you know, there was a huge array of work on education systems reform in the, in the 80s and 90s. And I always used to say that it's almost as if, because you know how um, the U.S. always had much more capacity to do sort of large-scale quantitative evidence um, building than Canada in, in the education sector and in the development sector. So it was almost as if the they could never Americans could never use that evidence effectively in their own education systems because education was so fragmented, so decentralized, and so politicized, um, and so much very much offered by you know zip code right what what policy you got depended on the wealth of your zip code that that none of these are sort of highly rationalistic models that were being developed by economists in the U.S had any purchase in, in American education. So it all got kind of pushed out into international development and um, really American approaches to planning shaped the world. I think that's kind of the same today. Like you have this highly rationalistic um, capacity in the US to do evidence-based policy making, but it's it doesn't aligned to what is actually the any understanding of political economy and Alec that would be that's got your name written all over it but <laughs> you know it really doesn't align to any sort of sophisticated notion of the political economy of use using evidence or of the use of science itself and the fact that <laughs> your president has everybody going on um, Chloroquine, oh, it's chloroquine, yeah. yeah. <laughs> now it's just a kind of. Well, you know, the next thing we'll be doing is because the chloroquine is the is also, of course pres present in tonic water, so I think maybe we'll just all I'll drink be, it. We'll all just drink gin and tonics, and <laughs> the world will be a better place. I'd like to turn to Claudia, uh, who has a question that uh, grows out of. Uh, Nick Burnett's work and, and your own. Claudia, can you unmute yourself? Yes, hello. Hi, Claudia. Hi, Dr. Mundy. Thank you so much for speaking to us, and um, I really enjoyed the reading materials you sent us. Um, so in Nick Burnett's article, he talked about one of the failures of um, international architecture of education is the inadequacy of the SDGs due to the fact that um, due to its lack of guidance to countries and its unsuitability for many countries who are in need of um, educational development. And he also talks about 
the need for a global discussion surrounding the future of education as one of the initial steps. And I know in your article, um, in your paper, you talk about one of the ways CIS has been proactive um, and contributing to education um, is asking questions about the education architecture. So um, with that in mind, my question is, how do you suggest we lean in when it comes to strengthening um, educational institutions? And um, how do you think policies and innovations around education can be um, optimized globally? You know, just to say that I, I very much agree in one part with Nick's argument, which is that it doesn't, it doesn't both, it doesn't bode well to have many completing su competing supplies of evidence and knowledge that are that without having some kind of aggregator or arbiter of those different approaches and that's that's certainly the international organizations have they have incentives not to aggregate they have incentives not to actually evaluate the utility of their approaches with one another because they're each trying you know even the world bank which is by far the largest of any uh, single donor and it's not bigger than bilaterals but it's in education it's the largest single um funder of education into in, in international development you know they need in order for the bank to maintain the knowledge work that it does, the staff that it does, it needs to, it, it can't, it doesn't draw that funding from its project money, from the actual money it lends to governments. So it needs to get as much of those global good dollars itself as it can, and it needs to brand itself to get those dollars. That means that it rarely really works collaboratively. It, it was, for me, one of the real wake-up calls when I was at GPE was watching the World Bank on the board continuously push the GPE away from doing any kind of technical or knowledge work base that would support governments because it would say that's my job that's our job we know what we're doing you shouldn't be you shouldn't be in the technical assistance or knowledge exchange space so um, certainly having some uh, arbiter in across these different knowledge functions to me would be very important. What I don't think is important is just putting a pool of money out and letting each organization come up with its own its its own approach without having to commit to proper evaluation, proper comparison of of its outputs. Future of education is such a hard topic. I mean, I said that already. It's pretty easy to like. I get to I get to twenty thirty, and I can tell you, okay, this is these are the five things we should do. And then I look at twenty fifty, and I actually don't know what to do. I don't. I and I and I think um, I don't think we're having the right conversations in our field in comparative education to get there. I know Iveta tried very much to have that conversation this year. <laughs> of course, CIS was not not fully held, just a little bit online. Her direction would not necessarily be the direction I would go, but I think, um, you know, had very interesting, um, ha has a very interesting inflection. I mean, the focus really on post-humanism and so on, I think is, is very challenging, but not the direction I would go. But think about, like, yesterday, I just finished reading a book called, um, Oh, David Susskind. It's it's um, the end of work or something like that. It's a it's a really really worthwhile uh, book. It's I would so recommend that you you read it. Uh, also, um, Yuval Harari, which I make all of my students read um, lessons for the twenty first century. Yeah. You know, um, we are entering a period in which which is really uncharted. You, History can't help us very much. Uh, it'll help us a bit, uh, but but we have climate change and we have a technological change that both bode to obsolescence of some of th the things that make up sort of the core structure of human society. So work um, and uh, opportunity for uh, growth of markets. Those two things are really not likely to get us to 2050. So these are this this is the debate. I think um, I'm hoping that this International Commission on Futures will will begin to have.
Um, but like I said, I think it's very hard to imagine. I'm also working on a, it's a three-year project to come up with a sort of new book on the future of educational planning that will come out after the UNESCO Futures <laughs> Commission. And I have to say, like, right away, you see that the limitations in these efforts to sort of plan and model things, you can see it in the COVID crisis, right? I mean, <laughs> you have degrees of, uh, uh, degrees of difference in models with, you know, highs of deaths at 240,000 down to like 20,000. I mean, it's like, so, so what kind of planning can you do with these? But, but in education, we don't really have any modeling that's being done to 2050. No really dynamic way of thinking about the end of work uh, at a global scale. I think uh, uh, there are some national efforts. So I don't think that was a very satisfactory answer, but <laughs> just to say, I really don't know what future is if we think of 2050 as sort of our uh, future horizon. Great. Thank you. Uh, Karina has a question also growing out of the Nick Brown, uh, <laughs> piece and also that relates to, I think, some of the stuff you were talking about with the health sector. Karina, can you yes. unmute yourself? Hi, Dr. Mundy. Thank you for the talk. Um, as Dr. Gershberg said, my question also relates to the Burnett piece, kind of um, going off of Claudia and thinking back to some of the other um, infographics and slides you showed earlier. Yeah. So Burnett, um, in, his, in his piece, posits three elements that are involved uh, in fixing the architecture of international agencies and institutions. And uh, one of these elements is learning from other sectors. So my question is uh, given your extensive personal experience working within multiple contexts, uh, in what ways have you used knowledge from other sectors in your own work? Uh, and what was some of, like, what was the experience and some of the outcomes like? And can you explain how um, this other sector knowledge positively aided your work? Mm -hmm. Well, I think that's been a big failure of my work and actually most of the work in it's sort of the comparative education field on global governance has very much, uh, uh, first of all, tended to shy away from placing the aid architecture in education alongside an understanding of sort of global governance itself or world order itself. So that's one problem. I've tried to be corrective in that way, but actually learning from other sectors, I don't think, I don't think my work has been at all geared in that way. And, and so, just to say, you know, <laughs> so I'm thinking of my great 10 year plan here. And my, my first part of my plan is to really um, look at this much more from a country vantage. This, what is it like to be part of this architecture and education? But as we're doing that work, um, it's started to become evident that we may be able to build in an arm in, in the studies where we look at whether from a country point of view, it's different to be part of a global health architecture versus a global education architecture. And what are those differences? So I think the first thing we'd like to do, rather than look at the architecture from the top down to the countries, really do a sort of bottom up mapping and do some comparison. So that that's very much been on my mind. Uh, and, um, and in fact, you know, I, in working a little bit with the Gates Foundation, which is just getting involved in international education, um, it's been that's been a sort of fascination of theirs to understand a little more. Like, what, what, isn't there something from health that education can learn? And they have sort of some intuitive ideas of ways in which education can learn from health, but also because they've had such a terrible experience. And I, I don't mean terrible, I mean, uh, I think they, they generally understand their education work domestically in the US to have not been a big success. So because of that, they also very much struggle to, to see uh, or, or afraid to, to use a health model in, in education because they see education has different complexities. Take a look at um, the, you know, they have an annual letter that came out. It has, a, it's a very fascinating section on what Bill Gates and Melinda Gates are thinking about education. That's, it's really worth a read. It's quick to read, but it's, it's very, um, very interesting. So all to say more work to be done in this area. I think there's a lot of good 
thesis material in that particular topic. <clears throat> Great, thanks so much. We have a group of five students that uh, are in South and uh, Far East Asia. So they're not able to join us live because of the time difference, uh, though they'll be watching on uh, the, the recorded version later. But we did um, get a couple of questions from them. So I'm just going to read one from uh, Sumya, who's in um, India. Uh, she says, uh, in your letter to the minister, you suggest employing and mobilizing the current structures. You make an excellent point about ICT exacerbating inequalities, which was the go-to solution for most. However, what about the countries where there is no funding, capacity, or even the desire to focus on education in the times of global crisis? The government school of my mentee in Bihar, India, is indefinitely suspended until further notice, with international funding being seriously inadequate. When my government in India is directing 100% of its resources towards simply providing the bare minimum health care for COVID-19, how can we ask it to focus on education? In fact, should we? Well, I mean, I think a couple of things on that. It's a very important topic. And uh, as Sumia, is that the name? Yeah. Yes, Sumia, uh, highlights, there are real trade-offs in what governments are presently doing. And the trade-off between, this is where we see a trade-off between health and education. Uh, but I think we know enough empirically um, to say with some authority that actually health and education are reinforcing investments. They are not investments that actually have a natural trade-off. In fact, they, and, and in fact, underinvesting in one over the other uh, yields less eff effectiveness of, of one or the other. So, I mean, I think now the question you asked is, well, then what would you, what can you say to a minister in such a context? And I think this very much uh, differs depending on which, for, in India, for example, which state. It's not the case that in Kerala, the Ministry of Education in India uh, has, is, is just sort of abandoning ship. That's not what's happening in Kerala. But it is in Bihar, uh, it is uh, the case. And I'm really happy I'll, I'll share. There's an, a really nice think tank in Bihar that's been doing a sort of national overview of the different COVID responses in different Indian uh, states. But it suggests to me that there are, there, it does matter what kind of leadership model is used during crisis and that leadership, leadership models that try to uh, leverage uh, whatever skills and capacity there is in the system that are set up not to force compliance, but actually to try to harness um, the skills and capacity that exists are, are more likely um, to respond effectively to COVID. Uh, so, you know, we today when we were talking with the Ministry of Education in Ghana, I was, um, you know, we did a review of what they're doing for COVID. And of course, like every system, my own included in Canada, high performing, highly equitable, one of the most equitable education systems in the world, in Ontario. Um, what did they, what, what, what did they do first? Try to leverage technology. What levels do they try to leverage technology? Higher levels of the system. Who's going to be excluded? Well, in Ontario, it's about one third of all children who don't have uh, access to a computer and internet. I couldn't believe the figure, but they they did a survey. That's what that's what the number. Same in in the UK, it's about twenty five percent. Now they might have they might have um, a cell phone or a tablet in the home, but they don't have regular access to it so you know wh what i what i was talking to the Ghanaians about was okay so what are what are you going to do for that in ghana it's a much higher percentage um even tvs are not ex not available for many families even even radio penetration you'll see i'm i'm, I'm doing a second set of that second in that series of blogs there'll be four of them uh that'll come out tomorrow or monday on uh, learning continuity and what do you do about learning continuity in the, in the case of COVID? Um, 
what I what I recommend to governments or what I would recommend to governments is that they think beyond COVID because COVID is COVID is is going to pass. Uh, there'll be a, a great deal of learning loss. How it, how can they make up that learning loss for the most disadvantaged uh, kids? And we've got great answers to how to do that. We've seen summer learning programs that target uh, poor populations in North America, in India, very effectively uh, jumpstart uh, education, uh, ju jumpstart learning for children around the world. So we know we know how to do that. That's very low tech, right? And then also there's some things that are high tech, but that actually are deliverable in this context in ways that privilege um, equity. So radio-based instruction, and guess what? Teachers, get those teachers ready to tackle learning at the bottom of the pyramid when they go back uh, into the classroom. Make sure that um, they're ready to offer these sort of summer learning options or um, accelerated learning um, uh, options. And then make sure that those teachers um, understand that part of their responsibility in this period is to reach out to the kids they think are going to be lost to the school because we know that in crises often uh, some populations of kids never come back into the classroom so make sure that they're reaching out and ensuring um, even distribution of materials it you know you know i've been to too many african schools where every material is locked in a cabinet this is not the time for that. This is the time to make sure that every household has access to some papers and pens and a few readers uh, for kids and that though so that they can be supported by radio instruction. So, you know, there's, there's solutions. Now, what makes governments have the political will to address to, you know, some countries that have more administrative capacity will go right to the higher end of their system, right? To the, the things that will privilege the privileged. Uh, they're very elite focused. That would be the case in Ghana. Now, the Ghana has, you know, kind of bifurcation. It's it wants to do both, but it it knows how to do the elite stuff much better. Um, does it have the political will? Uh, this is like a very difficult uh, problem. But I I tend to I tend to think, you know, I like to think. Uh, a little bit glass half full on this and think that there is actually in almost every education system there's the opportunity to develop a coalition of the willing even in the most corrupt um, and so asking governments to think about the COVID challenge not as as a challenge of leadership um, in which they need to put together a coalition of the will, willing that's focused on equity uh, I think is is you know the way the, the advice that I would give so so move them away from zero sum thinking about health and education move them away from uh, low hanging fruit which end up being elite hanging fruit um, and then um, challenge them to really think about what what's the coalition and uh, Andrew can you unmute yourself uh, yes Thank you, Dr. Mundy, for letting us learn from you. Uh, so I wanted to ask a question uh, about COVID and also your uh, 2016 paper. So you end that paper with a great Star Wars quote, do or do not, there is no try. Uh, and certainly in a time of crisis, it's vital to find equitable solutions to continue the process of learning around the world as soon as possible. Uh, however, the consequences for our solutions failing are often uh, felt by the most vulnerable. So my question is, through your experiences in leaning into international development, how can practitioners, organizations, et cetera, balance the drastic need to come up with solutions quickly while also working to mitigate the potential consequences of when those solutions don't go as planned? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, I'm not super worried about, um, well, maybe I should temper that. I, I guess my, my thought, first of all, thank you so much for like capturing that quote because my, um, my colleagues didn't like it at all. And in fact, it almost, they almost uh, required me to take it out of that article. And I said, you know, no, no bloody way that's coming out of the article because my, um, my son, I can't remember how old he was then. He was little, eight or so, and we always watched Star Wars. And and I was procrastinating with that speech for a long time. And he finally said, you know, do or do not, there is no try. And I was like, yeah, that's going to be my motto for life. <laughs> so, I mean, I tend to 
um, of course there's all kinds of harms that can come in education systems when people act. I think the the way to tackle this problem though is not to say don't do. So you know I would never say to the government of Ghana don't leverage all the online learning platforms that you have at senior secondary level. Sure do it but go back to the principles go back to the plan that you have for your system and and course correct so know that you're you're in by by investing your crisis management on these things you're not leveraging other things that you have committed to what can you do about those so really trying to go back to first principles first um goals objectives in it and that's i think it it won't preclude that you're going to make some mistakes i mean making mistakes isn't our problem in in um in education not iterating well i think is more of our problem in education um and learning from failure having a culture in which you learn from failure is our problem in education um especially inside public systems right which are which have i think uh i believe at least in in sort of post-colonial states there's a kind of hierarchy and fear of failure that is uh it's it can be very debilitating um so much so that like you feel you see with fear that that um any initiative for change is always um is is left to external actors you know you think about all of these franchises that are coming into west africa right now it is in a way a way to distance public the public uh, governance from these high risk interventions but without a sense of what's the principle that drives their inclusion in, in, in the system itself. So that, I think that would be, I, I think you gotta try and you gotta learn, but, um, but going back to principles and goals and objectives and really weighing whether you're meeting them by your actions on a routine basis is very important. Thank you. um we don't have a flood of questions uh on the in the chat um but we do have one uh you've mentioned thank you dr mundy you've mentioned having a vision to 2030 but struggling with the 2050 longer term vision what are the things that should happen in your opinion in global education uh Oh, it just 30. Yeah, I see the question. I see. I'm looking at the chat too. Okay, it just popped out, I guess, because uh, another question popped in. Um, uh, yeah, okay. Uh, to get us closer to the SDGs by 2030. Uh, you know, to me, the underlying question is how well can um, governments become ministry of education become uh, um learning organizations learning organizations by which i mean organizations that really um build out uh professional capacity at every level to use information to judge make judgments um about uh what's needed to change to reform their systems and by by evidence, I don't just mean sort of modeling. I mean also evidence like what's going on in the immediate context um, and who has the capacity to support those um, reforms. It, it, in the global architecture overall, now with COVID in particular and the, I think, very important devastating recession that's going to follow this crisis my hope is that we get to 2030 um, with something 
on the equivalent of the HIPAA initiative, something, some kind of a debt relief that uh, pins debt relief to uh, improvements in learning outcomes at the bottom of the pyramid. That would be sort of my, my today hope for getting to, to 2030, but also um, pays some attention to the creation of um, a more balanced collaboration around evidence and what works between developing countries and um, the Western suppliers of these models. Great. Well, one last question, and then we'll we'll call it quits. Uh, you can see it in the chat. Um, your 2016 article, "Learning uh, Leaning In on Education for All," is a reflexive analysis of the quote-unquote knowledge enterprise, multiple truths, and architecture of international educational development. And in your lecture, you referred to the return to high modernism uh, that often privileges scientific evidence over democratic processes. In what ways has the pandemic exposed existing and new truths and structural weaknesses in the knowledge enterprise and global architecture of IED? Well, I don't know if I can answer that yet because it's still not clear to me what COVID is doing to education systems. What I can say for sure is that um, <laughs> I've never seen more on my Twitter feed about how to retool international research using phone interviews in my life, I could never have imagined it. <laughs> so I, I think the drive for evidence is still very, very strong. You know, so I just want to go back to Habermas who really informed my thinking about education, about education policy. And, and in a way, very practically informed it when I was at GPE. So because I was the chief technical officer, I was the one who was supposed to be um, making sure the organization's strategies were based on evidence. And I thought of this a little differently than you might um, imagine. To me, evidence is not, it's, it's always contestable and almost always biased. But when you have evidence, it gives an opportunity for what Habermas would call a sort of democratic speech act. It gives you a focus to debate and to discuss and to organize your strategies. It's an opportunity to, when you put a piece of evidence on the table, it's an opportunity for contestation. It's not just an opportunity for truth. It's an opportunity for democracy. And so those two things to me are not mutually exclusive, but they require really, really effective processes in which, and, and really educated people around the table, right? Because you need to weigh judgments that are embedded in the evidence, and then also use the evidence to come up with new judgments. So it's a really, it's, it's, you're asking a lot of, of, um, of people to do that. Now, putting evidence into that kind of discursive um, process is possible. You can see that, um, and you can see um, situations where it's done more or less effectively. You know, today, I look every day to see, where's Canada on the COVID trend? Where's my province on the bloody COVID trend? And I can't, I go to the Financial Times, I see, you know, they give us the Canadian curve and they give me the Ontario curve, but they don't compare me to Sweden or something. But today, a simple doctor uh, with an epidemiologist has designed a blog where they simply lay out what evidence they have. What's the limits of that evidence? What, what, what can we say with what we know? What can we say? And on, base, on that basis, here's my judgment. It's not, I've modeled all this out. I just, we know this is how much we know. This is how much we don't know. It's not that hard. It's, it is complicated, it but it requires people when they're researchers to pay perhaps as much attention to how to communicate evidence how to engage in contestation about evidence as paying attention to proving the truth, <laughs> you know? So yes, of course we wanna have evidence, but we should 
think about how we can use that evidence in these more discursive formations that are linked to, you know, fundamentals of democratic practice. Well, with that, we're going to uh, give you a okay. virtual clap. There's one more question in the chat. I'll send it to you via email and maybe we can respond to the student uh, that way. But I think we, oh, that's very good, Andrew. That nice, like we've got like the clapping hands. Oh, up. that's new. I haven't seen that, a little emoji. <laughs> oh, look, see, now you're going to Somebody else talking. knows how to do it. Okay, I'm going to have to figure that button out. <laughs> Uh, okay, folks, uh, time to sign out. Uh, it's been... Hi, everybody. I'm going to sign out, and, and I'll, I'll jump on the other link that you've sent me, yeah? Okay, okay. great. To meet you all. Take care, everybody. Person one day. <laughs> Bye. 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 Thank you.